So, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, classmates. So, today we will present about a case study with regards to a 58 year old female with fever, headache, and vomiting. So, the flow of our presentation is first, what is Enterobacteria CA? Second is the case history. Third is the laboratory identification. And the last one is our discussion. So, good morning once again. So, before we proceed to the presentation of our case study, let me just give you an overview of what an Enterobacteria CA is. So, first of all, Enterobacteria CA are gram negative rods. So, that means in gram stain, they appear red in, in rod shape. All of them are glucose fermenters, which means that glucose is utilized anaerobically because they are also facultative and aerobe. Most of them can reduce nitrates to nitrites and they are oxidase negative. Most are motile except Klebsiella and Shigella. They are non-capsulated except Klebsiella. They are also non-fastidious and they can grow on Maconchi agar which contains bile. And most of the bacteria under this family are the commensals of gastrointestinal tract and it can be acquired through fecal oral route, poor sanitation, colonization of the skin, and respiratory tract. So let's proceed now to the case history. <clears throat> A 50-year-old female presented to the emergency department with complaints of fever reaching 102.9 degree Fahrenheit or 39 degrees Celsius and headache with associated nausea and vomiting for the past 24 hours. Her past medical history was significant for the resection of a recurrent hemangiopericytoma by the neurosurgery service three weeks prior, so nagkaroon siya ng operation. Hemangiopericytomas are a type of rare tumor involving blood vessels and soft tissues. These tumors can originate anywhere in the body where there are capillaries and the most common locations reported are the brain, lower extremities, pelvic area, head, neck. The patient also noted clear drainage from the surgical site which has begun five days ago. Other symptoms noted at presentation included decreased appetite and dehydration. She denied back and neck pain, photophobia or stroke and seizure-like symptoms and her vital signs were all within normal limits. So next is on her physical exam, a healing surgical wound was noted in the posterior auricular area with clear drainage but no blood or exudates were visualized. So as mentioned <clears throat> by Roxine a while ago, the patient has a recurrent hemangiopericytoma so that is why meron siyang uh, surgical wound sa posterior auricular area because of the neurosurgery. And then the drainage is clear. It has no blood or exudates na nakita. And then she had no tender tenderness when her spine was palpated. The reason why the spine was being palpated is to examine for lumps or irregularities suggestive of a tumor or fracture. And then on her neurologic exam, it showed a left-sided facial droop and tongue deviation, which were noted previously and attributed to her multiple central nervous system surgeries. So due to her multiple central nervous system surgeries, there are uh, side effects like uh, left-sided facial droop and tongue deviation. Those are ano, irregularities of the face and tongue. And then the next one is for her complete blood count results, it showed a mild increase in white blood cells and anemia. And then an external ventricular drain, which is also known as ventriculostomy or extraventricular drain, was placed on her so that uh, they can drain the cerebral spinal fluid. And it was sent to the microbiology lab for culture and the blood cultures and the swab from the surgical wound were also collected. So next. For laboratory identification, there are three methods that they did to determine the pathogen causing the symptoms manifested by the patient. 
and those are the gram stain, culture, and spectrometry. Here in our first photo, we can see that this is a result of gram stain smear. And as you can see, there are pinkish or reddish gram negative rods, as well as acute inflammatory cells, primarily the polymorphon clear cells or neutrophils. And based on our previous lessons, if mataas ang neutrophils, it indicates bacterial infection. So sa gram stain pa lang, we can already, ano, we can already think na bacterial infection yung cause ng symptoms ng patient. Here in our second and third photo, this shows cultures of CSF and wood swab in, in sheep blood agar and makanki agar. And sa sheep blood agar, the colonies appear large, glossy, and reddish-orange colonies. While sa makonki agar, it appears large, deep red colonies. So the colonies were analyzed using matrix-assisted light di desorption ionization time of light mass spectrometry or MAL-DTOFMS. And in this method, the analyzer separates the molecules galing sa sample based on the time it takes each of them to fly through the time of flight tube to the detector. And then the ionized sample molecules are then accelerated by a high voltage current and fly through the tube before striking the detector. So this is already an automated method, which is for microbial identif identification of characteristic proteins na isang organism. And according to what I have read, usually it takes only a few minutes to identify the species of different microorganism in using this automated method. And in this case study, the organism was identified as Seracia marcescens. Okay, so now we will discuss more about the Seracia marcescens. So, Seracia marcescens is a facultative gram negative bacillus that is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae family. Seracia marcescens is ubiquitous, meaning it is present or found everywhere in the environment, and it is the most frequent and clinically important species in the genus. Seracia marcescens usually doesn't cause infection in healthy individuals. It is notorious for colonizing and causing infections in hospitalized patients, particularly those who are immunocompromised, in intensive care units, especially intubated patients, and those with indwelling catheters. So that means that Seracia marcescens is an opportunistic nosocomial pathogen. Okay, so respiratory infection are most common, but Seracia marcescens has also been implicated in numerous other opportunistic infections, such as urinary tract infections, wound infections, and septicemia. Brain abscesses and meningitis are less common. Seracia marcescens has been implicated as the cause of outbreaks in hospitals. As I have mentioned a while ago, it is a nosocomial pathogen, and it can often be traced back to pieces of medical equipment, including nebulizers, bronchoscopes, laryngoscopes, and contaminated solutions. Person-to-person -person transmission is also recognized and thought to be predominantly transmitted via direct contact. And based on my researches, um, Seracia marcescens is also an airborne pathogen, meaning they can be uh, transmitted through air. So in the laboratory, Seracia marcescens can be identified by its characteristic non-diffusible red pigment due to prodigi prodigiosin. They are also lactose negative and in, in interpreting whether lactose fermenter or not, unicultured organism, the microbiologist should be mindful since in, in Makonki agar, the lactose fermenters appear pink, pink or red and baka makonfuse ito with red pigment ng serratia marcescens. So just remember na serratia marcescens is a lactose negative bacteria. It can also ferment glucose, it converts nitrates to nitrites, and it has a negative oxidase reaction. And a unique feature ng genus Seracia is that they can produce 
three proteolytic enzymes, namely lipase, gelatinase, and DNase, which contributes to the virulence of the organism. So the treatment of Cerasia marcescens infection can be difficult due to various antimicrobial resistance mechanisms, such as expression of extended spectrum beta-lactamases, ampicephalosporinase, and carbapenemases exhibited by the organism. Itong si ESPL and MPC are enzymes that confer resistance to most beta-lactam antibiotics including penicillin, cephalosporin, and monobactam astronam. And si carbapenemases are B-lactamases with versatile hydrolytic capacities, meaning they have the ability to hydrolyze penicillin, cephalosporin, monobactams, and carbapenemases. So si Cerasia marcescens, kaya hindi siya hindi effective sa kanya yung mga ginagamit usually like penicillin, cephalosporin, kay may resistansya doon. Bacteria producing these bead lactamases may cause serious infections in which the carbapenemase activity renders many bead lactams in effectivity. In the case of our patient, she was empirically started on vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam. These are, these are used to treat serious bacterial infections. And then she was taken to surgery for wound washout, removal of hardware, and repair of CSF leak. See, vancomycin and piperacillin are the two most commonly prescribed antibiotics in the hospital. Then her antibiotics were changed to meropenim and gentamicin. She was discharged to rehabilitation facility and received meropenim for a total of six weeks. Okay, so upon evaluating this case, we came up with the probable diagnosis that the patient has bacterial meningitis. It occurs when this bacteria get in your bloodstream and travel to your brain and spinal cord to start an infection. Meningitis causing bacteria are more likely to attack the membranes of your brain after a trauma such as a head fracture, sinus infection, and surgery like what happened to the patient presented in this case. She was resectioning of current hemangioparasitoma three weeks prior to her complaints of fever, headache associated with nausea and vomiting. These conditions lower your immunity and disrupt your body's natural barriers, leaving your body open to infection of any kind, including the bacterial meningitis. So the symptoms presented by the patient in this case are the hallmark symptoms of bacterial meningitis. Those are high fever, stiff neck, and severe headache. And if you develop the disease, you may also experience nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light, confusion, and a rash of purple discolor discoloration. So the patient here in this case experienced fever, headache, nausea, and vomiting. And those symptoms can begin quickly, sometimes in just a couple of hours, or they can also progress over a day or two. Okay, so another reason why we came up with bacterial meningitis as our diagnosis is the result of the CBC, Rumstein, and culture. In the CBC, it showed mild increase in white blood cells, as mentioned there, this in the screen, and anemia, which is both indicative of an infection. In the gram stain of the CSF, next slide, John. It showed many acute inflammatory cells, which is an abnormal finding and may also lead to an infection. And lastly, it is in the CSF culture of the wound swab, where the organisms was identified. This means that the wound from surgery was infected, which also re resulted to migration of organisms to the CSF, causing the infection. So that is the end of our presentation. Thank you, and I hope you learned something from our case study. Have a great day.